You're listening to the Low Pressure Podcast, the podcast for skiers. Presented by CMH Heli Skiing and Peak Performance. Well, let's uh, give you a proper introduction. We're sitting with Mason Mashon. Is that how you pronounce it right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's how, that's how you can say it, yep. Right? Uh, I'm a big fan. I've always been a big admirer of your photos. Uh, we've crossed paths a handful of times here and there, and I'm stoked you're finally in the studio. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. So uh, I don't really know a ton about you. Like, where, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Um, well, I grew up in Vernon, B.C., did you grow up with like all of the uh, like Riley Lebos and the yeah. uh, Margets and the Joe Schuster crew? Yeah, so for sure I know those guys from Vernon. Um, you know, Josh Bibby, TJ Schiller. TJ was my next door neighbor growing up. For real? Yeah, so we, you know, since we were kids, he moved there and I think it was like 93 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so he was, you know, I was in like grade three or something by then or four. So he was a year younger. But in between his parents' house and my parents' house, there was like an empty lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, it was two lots, but it was on a slope. So between our houses, we had like basically a... Uh, like a toboggan slash ski hill. A jib park. Yeah, and we would just like go out there and like, you know, put in little hits and whatever we whatever we could think up and uh and yeah so it was it was it was pretty cool growing up there in Coldstream um which is like kind of south of Vernon I guess but there's a lot to be said about the neighborhood <clears throat> empty lots man like like I we had a couple when I was growing up and it was that's just where all the kids go yeah that's where you end up totally yeah it's like all the neighborhood kids would come around because you know you'd pack down all the snow and it'd create like a sliding hill basically so and it's pretty safe, so you know, lots of kids would show up, and and then you know, eventually we would just like venture onto steeper paths and things like that. Because like in Vernon, there's like a bunch of like rolly hills. There's nothing really of significant steepness, but right. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we kind of you know get get your start there, and then um, you know we were at that age, we were already like skiing at the ski hill with Silver Star, right? Yeah, Silver Star. Were you part of like a race program or anything like that? No, I didn't I didn't race skiing. I skied only until maybe I was like eight or nine years old. <clears throat> and then I switched to snowboarding. Yeah. Yeah. When did you end up moving out to out west? Um, I moved down to the coast uh, right after high school basically. So graduated and then spent the summer there and moved down, went to university in Victoria. Oh nice. Yeah. So it just kinda transitioned out of there quickly. You know, kind of knowing that there wasn't really that much opportunity for me there, and you know that it's it Vernon's a it's it can be a really cool place, but it's also pretty rough around the edges, um, you know. So yeah, I think I think it was the right choice, and I had the opportunity to do so. And uh, so yeah, once I arrived on the coast, you know, Victoria's a nice place too, but it doesn't really have the 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 mountains. You got kind of, you're kind of close to surf, but not quite. Yeah, you're kind of not close to anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're, you're, it's not, I'm not saying it's not a nice place to live. It's, it's got some cool things going on. And, you know, obviously I was there for uh, a reason, you know, and. What did you, and, t- what uh, were you taking? Um, I studied geography. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, I like geography. I remember grade 12 geography. It was probably my favorite class. It's yeah. like, it's one of the few things that I remember from high school is like stuff from that class for sure and like i i connected in in that um class as well you know grade 12 you know had a really good teacher who was also really encouraging um uh, and saw some potential in in me as well so he's he's like yeah you should probably study that because you're, you're grasping it you know mm-hmm. and, and and it makes sense because of like all the outdoor activities that we're participating in you know whether it's mountain biking or skiing or whatever you're just like Without sort of knowing it, you are essentially studying geography by doing so. You know, you're out riding your bike, like you're you're surveying the land. Um, you know, you're going up a hill. You're, you're like, okay, like this down this draw or whatever, like you know, up and over this ridge, and like you're studying it. Even and even before even before like you get to the point where 
you're aware of what you're talking about. You're like, oh, you know that section with like the loose, uh, like the loose flat rocks there. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you're right. That's that's a yeah. good point. that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, identifying like the the features. And so, like when I was a kid, you know, I started racing mountain bikes um, at a pretty early age. And so, you know, you're traveling around and going to these different race tracks and things like that. And like when you go to a race course, you're basically studying it. Mm -hmm. So you, you th like the best thing you can do is try and memorize the course to the best of your ability, because when, you know, race day shows up, you need to be going as fast as possible. You have to know exactly what's coming at you. So, you know, intuitively and like without really knowing it, I, it, it just like made sense. And I think a lot of it equates to, to, you know, actively participating in, in sports like that. And then also, you know, the other, the other things that, uh, you're learning at that age, you know, and, and did you have a moment where you were like, Oh, that's a caldera <laughs> <laughs> or, or like something, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I remember sure, I had you know? that exact moment. I was on, yeah. I was on Whistler and, uh, <laughs> I looked over at, um, uh, armchair. Yeah. I'm like, is that a caldera? <laughs> Hold on, let me see. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's well, got the shape? Is that a volcanic yeah. shape or was that from glaciated right. terrain, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like that, that, that kind of stuff was fascinating to me for sure. You know, just like the way mountains are made and then also the way that they erode. And, and one of the interesting subjects that I really sort of, I guess not necessarily fell in love with, but I just thought it was like fascinating was geomorphology. And essentially that's like the, the study of the way landscape changes over time through, you know, the different inputs of erosion and or weather or, um, yeah. Or, tectonic shift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously lots of different factors that, uh, that play into that, but it's just like an understanding of like how things are the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And the way that they change over time. Did you have you did you do anything with with that like for for work or anything like that? No, or? no, I didn't. I didn't have that much intention to do so. You know, kind of like once I was there at school, I was like, you know, this is you know, school is school. I like this program, but it's still yeah, like well, it's like you yeah. know, I'm studying it, and like there's there is there is some career paths that you can take within that type of field, and. And I didn't really think that it was for me. And at the same time I, I was there, I was starting to practice photography with my friends. You know, we're going out and filming mountain biking and skiing. And, and then I was, I moved up to the, well, I moved to Whistler in the summers. So I'd come up here for four months and ride mountain bikes and, mm -hmm. you know, teach mountain biking and stuff like that. So, so I was like, you know, already kind of figuring out like that I didn't really want to go down that path. It was like, this is the path that I want to go down and, yeah. and, uh, finding a way to, you know, facilitate that was really just like part of the process while I was there. And, you know, I was, I was utilizing that time, um, while not working, you know, like I'm in school to, to practice these other things and just kind of sink my teeth into, you know, right. what, what really interested me. Did, did you get into photography? Like, were you the guy that was handed the camera? Because, you know, it is a group of people. And a lot of times there's a couple of reasons someone gets handed the camera. One, maybe they're not, the, they're not as good as the other guys, but also they are just better at it. Right. Like there's two kind of ways where you get stuck with the camera. Right. Stuck yeah. is, is a loose term. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. How, how did you end up getting stuck with the camera? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I wouldn't say I got stuck with it. I kind of chose it. Right. But, you know, looking back, um, I think that, you know, being on the athlete side of the camera had a, a you know, big contribution to wanting to be on the other side as well. You know, at you know, at a young age, I was working with professional photographers, you know, Ian Highlands and Ian Miller and some other, other guys, you know, and, and as, a, uh, as a mountain biker, as a mountain biker. Yeah. So we're like, you know, together creating images for catalogs and advertisements. And so you're involved like that. in that, f that creative process and you can see both sides of it. Cause you're like, you got, cause you have to have those conversations, right? You're like, well, Hey, for I sure. want you to hit that. The light's looking good here. Um, and then you're like, well, maybe you got those discussions. Well, maybe I'll come in it from this end, right? It's like a, it's a collaboration, right? Totally. As you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and that I, just kind of piqued your interest. Like, um, maybe I want to do this. Yeah. And I, I liked it. You know, I liked the, the artistic expression of photography and, you know, 
and just the you know creating something mm -hmm. you know so i started on film and like kind of went through the the process of just figuring out exactly what it is and how it's done you know and like the uh the theory mm -hmm. essentially so it was right around the time too where digital cameras were starting to take over um but are, i are still you, are you glad that you started out with film for that for, for that sure. process yeah. yeah i think it was it was uh it was the right choice because you know it's expensive to shoot film for one and being a student you know obviously not a ton of money um but it really makes you think about each image that you're going to take so in terms of composition and making sure that all your your levels are balanced you know to to achieve the result that you want so there's obviously a lot of learning that had to happen um, but it kind of forces you into just a little bit deeper of a cognitive process to you know taking the actual picture versus just like spraying it down and then like you know fixing it and tweaking it and right right and, right and digital post you know and even so. taking photos too like your eye like do you ever look at yeah. photos from back in those days and be like oh oh yeah there's some horrendous stuff. just like the podcast just like, you go listen to the first couple episodes <laughs> i'm like oh shut up dude <laughs> He's uh, super yeah, cringe worthy. No, for sure i was like <laughs> i was just like getting rid of some old stuff the other day because we're just like cleaning out the house and and uh it's just like saw all these old cds that had photos on them i was like oh, i'll just check and see if there's anything worth keeping and i like start opening some folders and i was just like wow these are just horrendous but you, you know it's like that's back then you know like you're just learning so you're just shooting a lot and whatever it's right. like you're just taking pictures of anything and everything. you're learning right you know, you're Lear learning. yeah learning do you ever has any have you had anything like are there any photos that maybe got published or that people use or that you see see keep popping up they're just like ah like maybe uh, don't want to be like you know what i mean like yeah i mean i don't know someone I, goes to the archives and they'll like you know there's an article or something on you or someone goes searching the web and they're like okay let's pull this one up and just use this photo and you're just like what the, <laughs> like what the hell is this one for man just call me and i'll give you something right i know yeah some people just grab stuff and obviously the internet is holding all sorts of weird stuff that stay tuned to the low pressure podcast website for a bunch of random crappy old mason <laughs> <laughs> match on posts. i think i'm gonna do that i'm gonna go yeah. find i'm gonna go see if i can search for one just a random photo from nowhere from somewhere yeah yeah go to like the mountain mountain life website from like for sure 15 I mean, years ago or something well, yeah i mean mountain life they're they actually the, the first ones that ever published a photo of mine oh is it your first yeah your first one yeah yeah so what was, was it that was fun um <clears throat> it was a photo of kurt sorge and it was like one of the first crankworks, I think, or maybe it's even before that. I'm not sure. Could have been a joyride event. Or let's see, 2005 ish. One of those. It might have been crankworks. One of those two. But yeah. anyway, yeah, there's like this big double built in the boneyard, and it was like a nice evening. They're just like practicing, and he did this huge Superman seat grab. So it's like shot on film is like velvia so it's like this super saturated blues and the mountains green and and he's just like tweaking out this huge uh move so that was the first one that got published but do you have uh, it in a frame or in a do you have the copy no, of it, no i don't i don't i have a copy of the magazine i do somewhere mm -hmm. in a stack of magazines <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah i have for you know same do you keep them all reason. i mean i i try and keep like the ones that i i know have pictures of mine in them but at this point it's just like i just have a massive it's getting overwhelming paper, you know it's, like, it's a bit much covers and stuff for sure yeah and then... i mean a couple yeah i don't i don't have like a ton of editorial stuff but uh yeah some stuff uh, yeah, yeah just keep keep for sure yeah and then, uh, well that's cool yeah I remember I got, I've had uh, my first photo ever actually, I think was also a mountain life that I had published and it was just this shitty <laughs> photo of like some random dude in a knee length leather like jacket standing <laughs> on a small patch of snow with like a bunch of dirt and it's like from a distance and it's like a, a gaper day photo oh, and it's yeah. literally the shittiest photo <laughs> you've ever seen. And I was yeah. like, Oh, there I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. But it's the context, right? Thanks yeah. guys. Yeah, exactly. Like, sometimes exactly. it doesn't have to be like the most technical photo. You know, yeah, it's yeah. funny. They were just like, Hey, do you have any gaper day photos? I'm like, yeah, sure. Here. <laughs> I was like, you use that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny sometimes, you know, like you, what my idea of like the best photos and say a batch of photos and, and what a, what another person sees, it's, it's us, it's, you know, can be interpreted differently. 
right? Depending and on who it is. And I was talking to talking to Jeff Schmuck, and he was kind of explaining to me um, some of his guidelines for like submissions, right? Mm-hmm. Like pick the if you got a sequence of ten, pick the best one or two if they're both ex- exceptional. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Are there a lot of uh, all the different outlets? Are there are they quite different with with what the requirements are, what they ask, or like yeah. some are strict and some are looser? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously different guidelines, and then, um, yeah, depending on how the magazines handle their assets, you know, and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I think for the most part, it's it's pretty like similar mm-hmm. across the board. Do you ever but... just like receive a check and be like, "Oh, shit! I didn't know I got published somewhere." <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I mean, most of the stuff now, like, I don't. I it's it's actually a really time consuming thing to be constantly um, submitting to editorial. Mm-hmm. It's it's quite time consuming. So. You've shifted quite a bit, quite heavily to commercial work now, right? Yeah, I mean it's a it's definitely a balance for sure and like I'm it's not all, not just photography either these days, so but Are uh, you doing like film work and stuff? Yeah, or? a little bit of film work, you know, some like producing and directing and other things and you know, then I'm also still on the other side of the lens mm-hmm. in a lot of stuff as as well so you know i kind of just like mix it up and keep it interesting and and uh yeah because uh, you know you know how it is it's like if you end up just pigeonholing into to one sort of um creative outlet then there's chances that you could burn out from from it mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and I, I i enjoy the the process of this is photography this, so yeah it's I just a challenge that. for the other stuff too right you got to keep your mind engaged yeah exactly you know, what, uh, what kind of pro- are you working on a project right now uh yeah i'm working on a project right now um it's wrapping up this week uh, but it's it's with a cell phone so i've done a couple of those in the last a cell phone like company kind of thing. Yeah, it's with Samsung. Oh, nice. Yeah, so they Get that Samsung money, son. <laughs> yeah, good for yeah. good for you. Yeah, I mean they're it's cool. They they're they're pretty stoked and. Um, Is it like a video project? Photo. Yeah, project? this one's more focused on the video side of things, um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's yeah, kind of bringing my photography and filming expertise into you know sort of a mainstream platform and just kind of helping others now would you be like a creative director on that sort of a shoot or like a like yeah a, kind of like managing the whole thing really because hmm. i'm they, it's essentially like a tutorial that they'll have on their website oh, and wow. then so like you know i'll be like hey here's the phone and this is uh this is how i'm using it and like you can use it like this too or whatever and this these are the things that that i look for when i'm out there and mm-hmm. and uh kind of just yeah showcasing the the phone in, in that way and it gives you that, that that nice balance between like you said editorial work and and this so now i bet as soon as this is done you're like all right let's go for a shred yeah exactly you know it kind of just like lightens the load a little bit and mm-hmm. and can just like bridge the gap and you know i'm obviously going to take some time off after this and and just kind of settle into life as a father <laughs> yeah congratulations <laughs> yeah. you would you, you're, yeah. you're uh, not far away from being a dad for the first time yeah yeah i mean maybe by the time this is out i'll be a father who knows actually to be honest with you quite possibly <laughs> <laughs> yeah so We've yeah got to, i gotta times. i gotta give a shout out to tim uh the editor on the show i think his wife is in labor as we speak as well oh, wow. maybe your kids will go to school together a little yeah, who knows? Well, right? COVID babies. Yeah, they're all over the place. You know, a lot of my good friends are are having babies this year mm-hmm. as well. So it's you know I think it's it's gonna be pretty cool. You know, having some, you know, having friends that have babies that are the same age. You know, they'll grow up. And it's and it's nice because we're we're you know? a little older too. We're approximately the same age, I would think. And this is like the second baby wave. Like I had all my friends that I grew up with had all their kids like mid early twenties, and now. All my Whistler friends are having their kids like late thirties, early forties, right? right? Yeah, totally. That, that was the same with with a lot of my high school friends as well. They, you know, got right into it. Mm-hmm. So half of my friends have like infants, and half of them have like kids that are like graduating, <laughs> learning how to drive, and like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're yeah. they're like they're they're able to babysit the kids, <laughs> the new kids that are coming up. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, which, no. which is wild. It's cool seeing those those like cycles go through. I mean, in, in, around here, it kind of makes sense, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, I feel like I, I, I was not mature enough at early 20s to be 
taking on that kind of responsibility, you know, and even in my early thirties, probably still not. <laughs> well, maybe not even, I, <laughs> you know? yeah, the true. I don't know if mature might be the word, but you're just out looking up. You're just living your life. You know, maybe a little selfish to say, or like a little selfish point of view, but like, I'm just doing what I want to do and I'm enjoying myself. So for sure. And you know, there's an elevated risk with a lot of these activities. So it's like, you know, is it the time, mm-hmm. you know, to, to be doing those things when you have someone else that you need to be caring for. So exactly. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's obviously lots of different ways to look at it, but, uh, and that's but good... yeah, I think it's like for sure it's a trend around here to have, have kids a little bit later in life. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we kind of pushed it right to the end because Deanne's, uh, my partner, she, she's like, you know, hair over 40 now. And, uh, you know, the window is, it's kind of closing at that point. So mm-hmm. did you have those discussions? Like, do we want this? Oh yeah, for sure. It's just like ongoing discussions for years. You know, we've been together for like almost 14 years now. So it's like, you know, like, okay, are we going to do this? Or like, you mm-hmm. know, and we're just like beating around the bush, like, nah, nah, nah maybe next year, whatever, right. you know, like we didn't really have any sort of plans like that. Um, but then, you know, we're just like, okay, well, are we going to go for it or not? Cause this is, this is the time. And if we're going to do it, then let's do it. So yeah. we just give it a go and pop. There you go. There he is. Well, let's get the, uh, the adventure. Like, you know, when you're young and adventuring and that sort of thing is a good segue because I think that's how a lot of people know who you are. Mm-hmm. Lots of adventures, especially this yeah. week, a lot of a lot of them specifically with your adventure buddy, Bush. Oh, Bushy Wayne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for sure. You know, I think, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I did build my career on on being an adventurous person. And, and you know, I, I, I still think that I can continue that even though we'll have a, a youngster in tow. So... Yeah, we'll see how strap how on the goes. baby yeah. Bjorn and yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go. Yeah, I know he's definitely he's definitely uh, what's well, it's, it's going to be a boy, but uh, anyway, yeah, he's going to have a a fun life. I hope. So I want to focus in on some of these adventures with your your partner in crime there. So a lot of times, mm-hmm. like I'm watching you guys, is you've done so many things, right? Let's go and hey, you guys want to go camping with the plane on the beach. Do you know what I mean? Stories yeah. like that. Let's go mm-hmm. build the teepee up in the middle of nowhere. Are a lot of the ideas, I know Bushy's just like, let's go have a good time. But I, I watching when you guys do get to get together and I see some of your stories, I'm like, part of me is like, is it Mason who influenced Bush on that one? Or is it Bush who influenced Mason on that one? It's like, hey, come along. So I honestly think a lot of it might have to do with you. And he's just like, oh, that's a great idea. I mean, like, it goes hand in hand. You know, obviously we are you know, adventure partners in that sense. So it's like, sometimes it's, it's my ideas and sometimes it's his, you know, he, he has like pretty crazy ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and you know, a lot of the time I'm like, I'll, I'll entertain it. You know, if he, if he envisions something or wants to do something, I, I just kind of like, so like, on, the par- you, on the partnership, you, yeah. you know, like I'll, on I'll the partnership there. side, or is he more like, all right, let's go, and then you're like, okay, how are we going to make this actually work? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel like there is a voice of reason that I bring to the conversation, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there there is also a level of trust in you know what Rory's capable of. He's obviously just an incredibly talented individual. So, um, in that sense, it's like you know, if if I if I th- honestly think that it's not valid then i'm gonna voice my opinion but i'm also gonna just kind of go along with it to see what happens (laughs) because it's kind of fun you know like i mean obviously you know people have different perspectives on on uh you know safety and Mm-hmm. Things like that, and you know, a lot of people would <laughs> would Sorry, assume Rory's perspective <laughs> on safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like from the outside, it may appear to be like super sketchy and dangerous. And I mean, obviously, there is a a level of danger and level of looseness too. Yeah, all, yeah. but you know, at the end of the day, um, <laughs> Rory is incredibly talented, so it's like. Yeah, there, there's a there's a level of skill there that's that's a little bit harder to see. And I think people might write off a little bit how calculated he is on planning and things as well. Like mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You don't get to do things like he does, fly a plane and achieve some of the the goals that he does just by being like, well, let's go land a plane on a glacier. Well, yeah, he does plan. It comes yeah. across as him being like loose and having fun, but like you don't yeah. get to do that without proper planning and knowing exactly what you're doing. For right? sure, and like consulting with your peers and like asking the right questions, you know, how to, how to do it. Like, obviously like to learn it, you have to do it. Yep. Um, 
but you know he does have a, an inner circle of, of people in in that respect you know with aviation and things like that where mm-hmm. he can talk to to other pilots and be like hey like is it, like how do you do this or like what do you like is this like mm-hmm. is this too crazy or whatever you know <laughs> but then you know there's there are there's so many other talented people out there to to discuss that kind of stuff with and do you does he is it does he ever hassle you to try and get your pilot's li- pilot's license oh yeah all the time yeah <laughs> and i mean i want to it's just like another one of those things it's like a it's a pretty time consuming ad- ad- adventure to to do it and i don't know the last few years have just been like so crazy busy for me so mm-hmm. i'm just like oh, i keep putting it off which is it's frustrating me at times for sure oh really it's like oh, i want to do it but i just keep putting it off and, you know at this point i'm just making excuses when, but, when the time's right it'll happen you know what i mean yeah for sure and, and 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 it will you know and and i think that um you know regardless it's like i can still bring value to the team you know and in, in other, oh, absolutely other ways you know helping navigate and because it's, you know, when you're flying around in the thing, it's like you kind of need both both people in the front seats to be pretty engaged in what's going on. How did the um, how did the uh, West Coast beach surfing camp life plans come about? Because you're a big part of that. I know I like, I like watching his stories being like, oh, I've got a, a glad Mason's here because we're going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Catching you know, salmon <laughs> off the beach, and right? I saw he he had landed on the beach for the first time, and then I was like, Rory, like, dude, let's like fly to like, like some somewhere crazy and like, go camp, you know, and fish and surf and do all that kind of stuff. And uh, he's like, yeah, let's do it. So he like picked a beach on the map, and we're like, okay, this one looks appropriate. And then we went up there, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we didn't really know exactly what was going on, and you know. We didn't push the plane back enough. I was going to say, was that before he had those tires? I remember, I think I remember bringing this up because I remember seeing that, like, we need to get this plane above the tide line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wrote a story about it in Mountain Life. I think um, that's, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, that was that was pretty crazy because, like, we, yeah, we, we weren't really prepared and didn't really understand exactly how high the water was going to go. I mean, we did, but... We kind of just like dragged our feet and then all of a sudden it was almost too late, you know. So we're like trying to push the plane back and we're using like logs and all Put this driftwood stuff. under yeah, the tires. Yeah, just like driftwood pieces and like random stuff. And like to get it, you had to roll it on them um, and then transfer it onto the next piece, right? So, so you're talking about like kind of a curb in between and it's like a little sort of rift between each piece of wood. So is he in it with, so. is he in the plane with like the propeller going, no. just moving or are you just like, no, we're pushing it backwards <clears throat> up the beach. Yeah. Up the beach. And you know, at one point it was just like all happening fast. The tide was coming up like really quick. And, uh, <laughs> so we're like trying to transfer it onto the next piece and this wave, like triples up, whoosh, comes in, washes the wood away, you know, and we're like running like 40, 50 feet to catch it <laughs> and then so we're like grabbing the wood getting it back and like the at that point the nose wheel had slipped off the piece of wood so all the water sort of swirling around it you've ever like stood on a you beach start sinking and, right? yeah it starts to sink so at this point we're like whoa like the nose wheel is like fully under the sand <laughs> and so rory's like around the back of the plane he's like He's pushing down on the tail as hard as he can to like pry the the wheel out. Yeah. And I'm at the front with a stick just like prying underneath it. <laughs> no tools, just Yeah. Like I'm just like <laughs> getting something, just digging the sand out with my hands and like prying it out. And then we get that out, put a piece of wood under, and then we're back to like pushing again and we're just like going as hard as possible for like <laughs> what felt like two hours, but it was probably only 30 minutes but yeah, it was it, just like a very intense just stressed out yeah you're like, well, we're like we're, using everything we've got did you have cell service out there no <laughs> so you could have been there for a while <laughs> yeah and, and like I, I have since learned stories of other pilots that have like straight up lost their planes because they they left them in the sand and then they got stuck in the sand and then the thing just melts into the sand straight up <laughs> so, so we, we were like right on the cusp of like a bit of a, a disaster for for that plane. The plane but. melts into the sand, and then in like 
three or like 45 million years somebody comes across like this plain yeah, fossil right? <laughs> in the yeah. middle of this used to be an ocean what the hell yeah, is that then? That is a, <laughs> yeah no who knows i mean i'm sure you could dig it out and get it out but it would just be a complete show mm-hmm. um but uh but yeah i mean we we got out of that luckily <laughs> but and, we learned, and camp, learned a lot right you got for sure we were like okay well next time we'll bring little strips of plywood to like push the plane on Mm -hmm. and so when the next time we went out it was like 20 minutes and the plane was like safe without nearly as much effort right because you're just like rolling it on flat pieces it kind of goes to what you're saying before you just go do stuff and you figure it out yeah we learned a lot in a very short period of time right and then also like you know we had planned for a certain number of days in terms of our like food stock and we ended up running out because we kept getting like marine layer that would just blow in when the tide was out. You couldn't fly. Yeah, so we couldn't fly. Um, and so that created some challenges in terms of like, <laughs> like all right, like you know, Rory, he's more of the blow it if you got it guy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and I'm like, maybe we should just like ration a bit of this food because like we don't really know. And uh, so luckily, you know, I brought some fishing equipment and stuff like that. So I managed to catch some fish <laughs> and we like survived. Hey, we survived. <laughs> exactly. But the next time we brought extra, <laughs> you know, just then, emergency and, food. And you're like, well, I know how to catch fish too. So we're going to supplement with this. Exactly. So like, you know, my fishing skills have gotten better over time as well. And, were, you, and, uh, were, you, were you already a fisherman beforehand? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've I've been fishing since I was a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, off the beach at the ocean. Yeah, I mean, maybe not necessarily that, but uh, but yeah, I've definitely like done some fishing and in, mm-hmm. in the ocean, and yeah, I was definitely like learning, but it was it was pretty cool, and and like to go into such remote areas, mm-hmm. the fishing is really good. Yeah. So. It's like the best case scenario. You go harvest clams and stuff. Yeah. Weren't you doing like some spear fishing or something then as well? Or? Yeah, yeah. We, we've been spear fishing out there as well. And then there's like stuff you can harvest off the, the rocks, you know, gooseneck barnacles, mussels. Mussels and things, yeah. Things like that. And uh, yeah, so it's like there's tons of food once you've kind of learned how to identify it. And um, and then, yeah, figured out how to cook it as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another valuable skill is that kind of like that kind of sounds like the dream for so many people let's just fly to a remote beach and just live try and live off the land and just be around no one else and just have these little mini adventures and yeah i mean it's i i still think those are like some of the best adventures i've been on Mm -hmm. you know it's it's amazing to go out there and you know be surfing and seeing all these crazy wildlife encounters and and then yeah, harvesting your own. Any food any wolf and, like encounters on the beaches? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we saw a whole pack of wolves one time at night, um, and they were just kind of they're just chilling, transiting. Right? Yeah, they I, they didn't really have any interest in us. They were curious for mm-hmm. sure, but there was a whole pack, all juvenile. Yeah, um, I came and, across a pack um, like no up near Cape Scott, North North Island. Oh yeah, just doing that uh, the hike, the north, yeah, north the north coast, coast trail. Yeah. Came through one of these little pocket beaches. Those are about 15, 20, 20 wolves just chilling. Yeah, same sort of thing, looking at us. I'll get up, start a stretch, and slowly yeah. walk off into the woods. Maybe a couple sit and look at us, and then they walk away, and you're like, "Whoa!" Yeah. And then you walk past them, and you know every single one of them staring at you. You can just feel that energy. You're like, "Oh Whoa. yeah, yeah." No, it's pretty cool. And we've had like, yeah, times where there's, you know, just like a single wolf that like comes by, like. They'll like have like a scout wolf or whatever that kind of just like sniffs stuff out and then mm-hmm. carries on. And Bushy's but she's like, "Hey, fella!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess like when he he first landed on the beach and went camping with uh, Stacy, he like woke up and Dexter, his dog, was just like playing with a wolf. Playing with the wolf. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> yeah. <And laughs> I mean, it... like Dexter has definitely got some wolf in her. I don't know how much, but. She's, yeah, yeah, she's, she's pretty. She's pretty definitely wild. capable. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's so it's it's cool. They're they're dogs, and like, yeah. Even last summer, we were boating around and camping on the beaches, and we saw some wolves out there. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there there's lots of different wildlife. And do you guys have like a same beach that you, you set up on every time now, or do you kind of um, mix it up? No, I think I mean we we definitely have like a few favorites, but 
Uh, I love that you can say that. Oh, we have a few favorite random, super remote <laughs> beaches off the west coast of British Columbia that yeah, we like to frequent. There's still like there's still so many. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know some are further to get to, more complicated, and then others are are just a little bit more straightforward. And do you have like a specific mission every time? You're like, well, let's go to this one because it's got better surf, or we can fish well, better on that one. Yeah, I mean they have, they definitely have like their. Um, yeah, there are different benefits, and and it also depends on the swells and the thing and things like that. So, like when you know, like oh, there's a big swell coming in, like let's let's fire up the plane and go surfing. For sure, I and I watch it, so I'm you know in the you fall I'm up, a like, pretty avid go. surfer, and like if I'm like hey, like you know, Rory, like this, this could be the swell for this wave. Like we should probably go. And then you know? you've got this. You got a private wave. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's like occasionally you'll see other groups out there that have, um, you know, taken float planes in or or got dropped off by boats or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like there is, you know, there's there's a lot of adventurous people out there, and we've met people from all over the world in some of these locations because it's, uh, you know, it does take quite a bit of effort and sort of planning to get out there, and and you know you're gonna, you know, you'll you'll see other adventures. Mm-hmm. And you bring your, do you bring your camera to all these trips? All the time, yeah. yeah. I'm a, I, I usually bring all sorts of gear up when, when I go out on these things. But, yeah, I try and capture it with the camera. You know, I bring the water housing, et cetera, all the little trinkets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm a pretty heavy load. But it's nice to, like, come home with those memories and right. and photographs and things like that. And, and are for those trips <clears throat> more for yourself than they are for, you know, submitting to like photo editorial or whatever like just yeah. it's just more for me like look what i was able to create it's like art for yourself for sure yeah and <clears throat> and you know shooting photos from the plane is also um it's such a nice way to see the landscape mm-hmm. so i i think a lot of the the photography work that i've created on on those trips is more personal than than anything but mm-hmm. you know it, it's not that it's not subjective to being sold as fine art or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, it's for but you yeah, I, it's, I typically don't go out there with, um, you know, a, those types of objectives. An intention for that, right? It's yeah. Just, I just, this I mean, is, this is what you do and this is what you enjoy. Yeah. Whether it's for work or for not. Like I like yeah. doing this because I like doing this. And I mean, we've, we've <clears> definitely <throat> like shot some stuff that was for more for work using the, that, that kind of trip as a model, but, uh, pay for, pay for airplane fuel, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not cheap to do any of that stuff for sure. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely like, a. um, like I said, I, I hold those types of chips pretty close to my heart just cause they're, yeah, so adventurous and, and enjoyable. And, and you, you know, every time we go out there, something special happens. Right, right, right. That's pretty cool. I also wanted to talk about uh, the teepees, mm-hmm. teepee, teepee town, and uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you're you're a, a member of the indigenous community, uh, which is really cool. Um, that do you do you have like really close ties with kind of your indigenous or your, your indigenous side? Um, like, would I'm, you feel comfortable explaining kind of how that ties in with your life? Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't say that I have like really close ties and connections to like my indigenous side of my family because it's it's a little bit complicated Mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah it's obviously like a a part of who i am you know and and uh our family history as well so so yeah i mean the teepee the teepee is definitely like a a way in which that i've been able to you know connect with with my heritage and in that sense and, Mm -hmm. and kind of utilize that, uh, you know, symbolism, I suppose, as a part of my identity. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And, and, and obviously it has, you know, huge benefits to the lifestyle that, that I'm already living to be immersed in the, in the woods or wherever in the mountains. Um, and, uh, using that, that, essentially ancient technology to yeah. to enjoy the yeah the natural environment so how did the idea for that come come about was it a, was it a desire to like you said connect a little 
tighter or you know become a little more familiar with you know where you're from and and, sure. and your heritage and be like I'm gonna was it just one day like I'm gonna build a teepee yeah I mean I, I'd spent some time up in Alaska like in northern BC and we were camping up there in the spring so it's still like winter conditions mm-hmm. and I was like sleeping in this little tent and I was just like this sucks <laughs> 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 it was like you know it's cold and it's tiny you're like in this little cocoon you know like this is not that fun so I was like okay like you know wall tents are like whatever they're they're pretty cool stoves in them um, but they just like they can collapse you know mm-hmm. I was seeing some other people using did you them. see the uh, the air dome up at lot 8 I did see that uh, yeah it's <laughs> yeah. fully collapsed yeah yeah so it's like you know something with like you know angular surfaces like that flatter um, could collapse under heavy snow and you know how much snow we get here it's crazy it's like it's snowing right now. Yeah, it's like, snowing right now. Like crazy out the window. There's all sorts of buildings and stuff collapsing these days. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, obviously, you know, it's like, okay, started piecing it together. I was like, well, the teepee is like, that's the that's the shape for like living in deep snow and, mm-hmm. you know, not stressing about your setup collapsing, basically. Right. So I was like, okay, well, that's that. <laughs> you know, that, it's like the light bulb came on. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. So the next year I, I went up, I, I stopped at my friend's place in Moberly Lake and he's, uh, he's Cree descent as well and his family and his grandmother, um, and him were really helpful and just kind of providing me with the, the guidance I needed. And, and did you like uh, build one on the property at his place or something? Or? Um, no, no, they, they actually, they, we didn't build one there. Um, but you know, she gave me the, the lessons that I needed and, and, uh, they also helped me out with some poles. Mm-hmm. So they gave me like a set of poles to use. How many do you have? Um, I mean, it depends really on the size of the canvas. Um, but, uh, yeah, typically it's like 15 poles for like a 15 or 16 foot TP. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So, yeah, the, the rule of thumb is, is uh, yeah, one pole kind of per foot. Yeah, circular foot sort of Cir- thing. Yeah, it's like the, yeah, the diameter and then also the height is like mm-hmm. kind of proportional. But, uh, but yeah, so anyway, that, that was like the beginning of, of that adventure. And, and, you know, I went up north again and camped in it for three weeks and, you know, being able to have a fire. And, and were you up there for work and, and things? Um, I mean, kind of, yes, but kind of no, it's you another, know, another, life, another, another mace like, adventure. Yeah. It was just like, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we were up there to shoot skiing and enjoy it, but there wasn't any sort of attached assignment to it. It was like, okay, mm-hmm. this is just like life goals so everybody's in their their expedition tents and you're in the you're in yeah the, well the, the, TV the, no, the crew was in like an rv and i was like out in the out in the flats like camping in the in the teepee so and you prefer it i prefer it yeah yeah i mean it's obviously nice to have the comforts in the of a of, you know an <laughs> rv and stuff like that there's no microwave charging in the TV. yeah <laughs> charging <laughs> batteries and whatever um, and, you know, we'd hang out in there, but, uh, but yeah, it was just nice to have the, the, the TP to just more space. And what's like the know. square footage? Like, is it like, like where we're sitting right now kind of thing? Like this little square? Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, it's yeah 15 feet across. And then obviously if you're on deep snow, you can dig it down. And then in the past few years, we've definitely elaborated on the interior setups to uh hang some photos and <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you can hang all you kind of have to hang lots of stuff so one time i just like strung like a, basically like a dream catcher net a little cat's cradle kind and, of thing yeah, yeah exactly catcher. and then you can just like put jackets and things above you and and uh lighter stuff or like hang stuff to dry because mm-hmm. you know going out into the backcountry and you know, skiing and snowboarding and deep snow you get super wet especially around here. So, um, yeah, the key to like being comfortable the next day is drying your stuff out. Yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> yep. having the fire and, and, you know, did you have like a little stove in there? Or were you like, yeah, now we, now we kind of run a, a little bit tighter setup. Like at first we were just running open fires 
and and then you'd open the top, the smoke flaps, and and then the smoke would just get sucked. It out. It would go out. Yeah, but it it camping in the deep snow created some airflow problems, and also just the the swirling wind conditions and things like that. So you'd from time to time we'd get pretty bad backdraft through the top. Oh, which. Would then result in like ash and everything just flying smoke. around. Yeah, smoke. Like, yeah, you're just getting smoked. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we've ruined some jackets. It's like they smelt so smoky, we couldn't even get it out. Just <laughs> <laughs> full on campfire. You gotta be careful too, because if you got like, oh you yeah, know, like Gore Tex and stuff, it just melts, right? Oh yeah, I've melted boot liners, gloves, you name it. <laughs> melt a little bit of everything get little burns little things like, a little ember burn yeah stuff, exactly right? so you truly it, hanging out like, at the TP if you didn't have a- it was pretty rustic at first for sure and then we just slowly tightened up our, our show and now we have like a a stove baffle that goes out the side so it's like you can just seal the top it's it's fine like when it when there's like gentle winds or like more predictable wind directions but as soon as it starts to twist then you have to manage the direction of the smoke flaps if you're having an open fire because um, basically you need to create the suction using the flaps. So it's like the back, it's like the backside of a sail. Mm-hmm. It's uh, like a vacuum effect. So you have to angle them in a certain way, and there's different techniques in how you can angle the the smoke flap to create the draw. But then you also need to have the the airflow, and when the bottom of the canvas is buried in snow then obviously there's nowhere for the air to drop sneaking underneath right yeah Yeah. so then it it ends up uh creating just like a a backflow problem or it comes in through the door or whatever so it's like there's there's other little problems that we kind of just like learned and figured out we're like okay this is a bit much you know like just getting smoked half the time and being uncomfortable in that sense right but uh but yeah, we, we we learned over time and like figured it out and it's the same process. You know, it's just let's go do something, right? Just let's do it. Let's do it. Figure it, and, it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out as we go. Exactly, and like slowly tighten it up, and and now we're we're pretty comfortable out there if we're staying. Because you, you had uh, you had the TP set up at the top of Burke's Bumps for a little while. Mm-hmm. Is it still up there? Um, well, I don't leave it. It's no, but like, is it still, but, like, have you set it up for this season? No, I haven't set it up this season, no. No? No, I, I just figured with Junior coming, it's like, you know, it, it, there's a level of maintenance that needs to be, um, yeah, taken care of mm-hmm. when you set up. So I don't want to leave it up and right. not be attended to, basically. Yeah. It's just like, it's a nice piece of fabric and... And, um, yeah, I just don't want it. Do you just it's have like, like a, a lot of work to, to set it up and just to just sledding out 15 poles? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we, we stash them. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll just like, you know, create a set of poles and then, then we'll just, have you created a, like your own custom set for like certain locations or you just go and start chopping down saplings and stuff? Um, yeah. I mean, like when we harvest TP poles, we, we typically, you know, looking for like st- little standing dead ones that, you know, in second growth forests are actually pretty handy for that because they grow so tight. There's a lot of those little trees that just don't they win. They just don't win. Yeah. So you'll just get this perfect little straight TP pole that dies off after like 15 just years. Chop off the and branches then, and there you go. Yeah, just, and it's already dry. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, like we do have TP poles in different locations. Um, yeah, based on, yeah, different activities. Would TP work on the beach or no because of the wind? Yeah, it could. It's just like, how do you get the poles there? Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> I like, thought of other ways to do it. Maybe like just using a chainsaw and splitting splitting logs. Some Just um, some driftwood? Yeah, just find like a, like a nice straight pole. Like there's tons of driftwood that just like shows up. Mm-hmm. Stuff that escapes log booms or whatever, you know, there's, there's all sorts of random wood. Um, but yeah, like it would take time, but at that point it's like, you know, do I, do we really need the TP out there? It's like, right. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. Like you're usually fine in just like your tent and like a little right. tarp set up or right, whatever. Right. 
more short term. Have you started uh, daydreaming about taking Junior on these, uh, <laughs> on these missions? Oh, yeah, for sure. Cause it's, well, I'm it's, already thinking, like, maybe it's, this spring, you know. It's, it's a different know. style of mission, too, right? There's one thing to go with your friends and your buddies, but then, like, to take your like your kids and, like, you have to – that's a whole new learning experience for you as well. Like, I know how this works, but now how do we incorporate a child or an infant? Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're definitely thinking about it. And I think, like, maybe this spring – once uh, once we've sort of dialed in our program a little bit more, obviously, mm-hmm. like you have to kind of figure all that stuff out as well, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely an option for us, like to to go up there and set it up, and then camp with the, with the youngster. That's exciting. Yeah, and you've got some ideas of where to go. And... Yeah, I mean, obviously, just keeping it simple is key. Mm-hmm. I think for that, and then you know, just like I want, you know, Deanne's obviously taking the season off. Um, so Matt she's, leaves, yeah, yeah, and she she'll want to be riding in the spring, you know. So I'd love to, uh, you know, give her those opportunities as well for obviously sacrificing the the beginning of this this winter, you know. Well, we <laughs> it was timed well because we've got like the best month of snow I think I've seen in a long time. It's true, yeah. So you're getting it now, and then you can probably hold you over for a little while, right? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely had a good month and, and <laughs> uh, enjoyed enjoyed it thoroughly. So you know, there's no like fear of missing out there, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, but a- yeah. A- any concerns with like, you know, with like work? Because you like you said before, you kind of diversify. You're not necessarily just taking photos, but you're also working on other bigger commercial projects, that sort of thing. Do you have any concerns or, or worries about work and, and providing now that you've got a kid coming along the way? Because... Um, no, I'm not... I don't have any concerns, so to speak. You know, obviously I'm going to kind of deflect some of the, the work opportunities... Uh, into you know maybe middle of the winter mm-hmm. and into the spring but uh, yeah that, I mean that being said it's it's uh, yeah no not really too much stress we've saved up money and and uh, yeah so we can kind of just cruise for the sounds first. like you got it <laughs> dialed <Yeah>. buddy that's <laughs> yeah. that's awesome yeah so it's good and and you know there's still lots of, lots of work opportunities available so yeah. Are there any like projects or any like bucket list items with your photography or with your creative output that are just nagging on you that you're like, maybe not nagging, but like are just there. It's one of those things that just get more and more and more. Yeah. I mean, well, there's always ongoing projects, mm-hmm. you know, and the ones that just get back burned and things like that. But, you know, I've, I've been pretty passionate about powder surfing. Powers, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. I was just, I was <laughs> excellent. I was just thinking that because you're a pow surfer. Yeah, and I love it, and it's something that I've, I've uh, been doing for a while now, and really enjoy doing it as well as also creating the boards to do it on. Do you work with Gary Wayne with with Sheldon? Yeah, yeah, I've worked with Sheldon on a bunch of boards. We've created I quite think, a few together. I think if I remember correctly, he was episode three. I think it was episode three, and he was doing Gary Wayne sh- Gary Wayne shapes when he's making skis. Oh wow! And he came over with like a pair of like parabolic like, Gary Wayne shapes yeah. with a skull candy top sheet on it. I think it was episode episode number three. I think. Wow, that's um, awesome! And then yeah. and then he's gone on to pow surfs to uh, wake foils. Yeah, yeah, he's doing like wing wing foils and all sorts of other like composite kind of things. So it's it's pretty cool, and I go and sit down with him and. We just chit chat about making stuff and you know i always bounce ideas off him because he's such a clever guy right he's you a, know yeah he's a builder he's always his mind's always tinkering even yeah. when he's not tinkering his mind is for sure constantly right and yeah he's got lots of great ideas and then also he puts them in application so it's mm-hmm. it's pretty cool and I've, I've i've been following along he's just like taking off with the wing foil stuff and just like He's having so much fun with it, and it's really it's really cool to see him. Yeah, seeing like find his, that seeing joy, vi- you know, videos of him like pumping like a wake behind the Abma's boat. Yeah. on the way to like the house sound. Yeah, he taught me how to how to do it. Oh yeah, yeah. Is so it he, is it as hard as it looks? It's super hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's hard for sure. It's like it's there's just lots of counterintuitive motions. You yeah. know, and like it's just a different thing. It's but. like the counter steer version of a of a water sports, like on a sled. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's bizarre to get a grasp of it. And like the first day we went out, it was just struggle fest. 
I like never felt so kooky in my whole life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, you, you you think that you have a pretty good handle on board sports or whatever, but I was just like brought down to level one. Yeah, right. You know, uh, humbled. Yeah, s- exactly. And, and then humbled. I tried it again later in the summer and and got a better grasp of it. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of clicked in a little bit more, but. Yeah, it was just like, wow, this is not easy. And I don't know if it was just because the board we were using to just get the feel for it was like a large object and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's this big floaty thing. And it does make it easy because you can start standing on it. But but once I tried a smaller board, I was like, actually, this is way easier because it's way lighter to control. So you can like, yeah, like you can use your balance skills. Does the feeling... Is it when you finally get the hang of it? Is it similar to say like riding a snowboard? Um, I mean, yeah, it's like three dimensional balance. Mm-hmm. So it it is like, it is similar in some senses, mm-hmm. but what's different is that the like fore aft balance. You know, it's like you press on the the nose and the thing like accelerates kind of. So it's like trimming, yeah, like a surfboard or something like that more more mm. water sport related, yeah you know what is it what is it about the no boarding that like really fires up about you said you were thinking about you know doing some sort of project or it's it's kind of really what inspires you right now yeah i mean i just like want to basically write like a love letter to no boarding you know in the in the form of film and uh, a little Pouser film. Yeah, it hasn't really been done before, has it? It has. Like yeah, big, like a big length, full length. Maybe one? not full length, but I don't think I would be able to tackle a full length at this point. Mm-hmm. It would de- it would depend really ultimately in, yeah. in on how much money you could raise to do it because it's obviously like filmmaking is an expensive thing to do. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I just I just love that sport a lot, and you know the there's this sense of pureness to the interaction with the board and you know you it's just a it's such an enjoyable thing and i just want to kind of speak to that in in uh in a film sense you know like because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's yeah you know riding those things in deep snow and just powder and just like it is like the closest thing there is to actually surfing. Right. So you're not strapped down. It's just a nice loose. You're just going with the terrain and the conditions. Yeah, exactly. And you know, when we're out there, we're constantly looking for features that resemble, um, waves or oh, yeah? like, you know, to achieve that feeling, finding like banks and things like that, where you, you know, you, you, you go up and get a sense of weightlessness as you crest the turn and then you just like crank on the thing and, just spray snow and whatever you know it's just like and it's accessible for low angle terrain too so exactly. you, you, you can ride it almost any time no matter well within reason whatever the you know the avalanche conditions or the snow conditions are you can find a spot where you can go totally yeah it's it is in that sense yeah it, it broadens the horizons i guess you could say in terms of like what you can find simple joys in you know and I think the challenge too, just like it is kind of hard to ride them effectively. <laughs> I've wanted to get one for a while. I was hoping maybe this year was going to be the, it'd be the year. We'll see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think like it just makes like simple terrain exciting. Like you do like a six foot drop off a pillow and, and land it and you're like, wow, like I can't believe it. Like, oh, when you're on a, when you're on a yeah. snow, snow yeah. and you're not strapped into the thing. Right. So it's like. Yeah, it just like makes it exciting and and it's yeah it's super fun to to ride, um, but yeah you, you also need like the the right conditions and things like that. So it does take like a a few different variables to to line up. But yeah, there's typically always something you can kind of ride on those things. Yeah, is that kind of your go to these days, or like on a, on say a day like today where you don't have a million errands and tasks and podcasts to to record? <laughs> like, yeah. are you? Are you getting together with some buds and you're going no boarding? Are you going to go up on the mountain? Like, what's your what's what's your kind of a day like today? Yeah, I mean, a day like today, if I know the snow's deep, it's like no boarding. Yeah, that's your yeah. go-to now. Yeah, I mean, I, I I usually bring a snowboard as well, but I'll just wear my powder surf boots because there's like a specific sort of boot that we wear for those, and they're essentially like. It's not like it's not like it's not like a snowboard boot. No, they're just super soft. 
Mm-hmm. So there's like there's no rigidity in the shell. Because you have to be able to have the boots got to be able to like mold to the board, like, fl- yeah. like flex need, into the board. Yeah, and you need ankle um, articulation. So, and that's like part of the. the so you could wear like beauty. a pair of, pair of rubber boots or something. Yeah, well, those are my pal surf boots right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was wondering because I was looking at those because they didn't. That's what I asked you. I'm like, are you going riding? I'm like, those don't necessarily look like snowboard boots, but they also aren't snowboard boots. Yeah, those. I mean, that's kind of like a hybrid, and that's what it's evolved to. Uh, Weldy Nyvelt, uh, he's he's like the Osmo guy, pro snowboarder, um, and he's worked with Vans on those to to create this boot, and it's like, it's a combination of all those effects, like having just enough stability that it's still like safe mm-hmm. ish, <laughs> <laughs> and and then yeah, having all the articulation and board feel. Yeah, because you you really need to have a good feel on the the surface of the board and what you're gripping onto. So, Are those your sled boots now too? Yeah, well, I sled in those. I guess well, it's sled this, snow, yeah, kind of double yeah. duty, right? Because if you're going sledding, you're bringing your snowboard with you for right? sure. And I I don't love sledding in those because they do, they don't have um, much like support for impact. Mm. So if you hit something hard or like do a jump or something on your sled, like it's. Uh, <laughs> It's not the best boot for it. Let's just say it. Like, yeah, I have like some minor ankle problems and it doesn't help. <laughs> but it's like, do I really want to be getting into the habit of like switching my boots and like basically becoming like a, a skier? A skier. I was going to say easy, <laughs> easy, easy. This is a skier. No. This is a skier spot. Well, I, I know what you mean though. I yeah, know what you mean. No, I know. I'm not saying it. it's like, I have nothing it, against like how many, how, like how, how many of us are like, ah, oh, are you, are you sledding in your ski boots or like are you going up in your regular boots and then putting your ski boots on? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of skiers that I hang out with, they run boots like that, um, on their sled to get out there and then they switch. Because like you ski in your sl- ski boots, you slide in your ski boots, they get tra- they get trashed fast. Oh yeah, and your sled gets trashed, and your legs and your feet hurt, and you're cold, and you're like, yeah, ah. yeah. I'm. I That's just, why a lot of skiers are like, I'm just gonna go sledding. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> like, like don't bring their gear even. Yeah, and fair enough. I mean, I I I've only sledded in ski boots once, and after that day, I was like, I just. <laughs> I just can't. I'll ski. I'll ski on the resort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do. I do go up there and I ski ski around and and I enjoy skiing. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like. Are you a skier first or snowboarder first? Well, I I told you earlier. I I started on skis. Yeah. Right. So when I was yeah. But skied, in your mind, if you skied till I was eight and then I I gave it up, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I've I've always sort of felt that I was a snowboarder. Do both, right? Yeah. It's good to have both. Yeah, I mean, it, they have uh, different feels, you know? Yeah. And so, I like I, like I said, I enjoy skiing, so when I, when I want to go up and rip some turns on skis... It, I, it depends I, I on like the a, conditions, too, and who you're riding with. Like, it's totally. nice to have options, right? And, and, like, getting around the mountain is way better on skis. Yeah, like if you're out shooting or something, right? And you're, yeah. you can be like, oh, I can act. I'm going with Adam or I'm going bushy yeah, on a, on just a like mission. Yeah, traverse over to stuff. It's just like, it, just like the mobility of skis on yeah. the resort is, yeah. is much more practical, I would say. Just stay adaptable. It seems to be your mantra. It yeah. seems over the course of this conversation. It's just be open to learning and be aware and just adapt to what, what you need. For sure. And like, you know, I find enjoyment in all those different things. Because they are different. It's awesome. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, and it seems like you do that with work, too. You know, with your creative outlet and your work outlet. It's like you don't tie yourself down to one thing and you just kind of keep it open. Yeah, exactly. You know, if, if someone approaches me with a, a, an interesting idea or project or something like that, I I try and assess it as in terms of am I capable of pulling it off? Mm-hmm. And then also as a challenge, you know, like, okay, like this, this, this is an interesting challenge. And, mm-hmm. and can I do this? And am can I, I do this? And am I going to be able to grow? What can I, I gain from it? And right? like how much, you know, how, can I pull it off? Basically. Yeah. And obviously you need to have a level of confidence in that <laughs> yeah. sense. Um, but then also, yeah, to, to be able to pull things off and, and make them happen. That's it's, cool, it's man. Key. So yeah, it's, it's fun. It, it, and like you said, it, it makes life enjoyable and, and it just keeps it interesting and different and, and uh, yeah, it's all tied together. And all those life experiences definitely culminate into some really 
beautiful art. Like I said, I'm a big I'm a big admirer of your of your photos and, and what you do. So I'm stoked that you're here. Do you have uh, like a website or uh, like a print a page where people can get prints or anything at the moment? Yeah, no, I don't. It's that's another. You get into that, NFTs. That's uh, that's definitely like backburnered at the moment. I'm I'm so bad at that. It's just like the website's been. A huge question mark for me. I'm in the same boat right now. I'm in yeah. the middle of a two year website ordeal. Yeah. So, but you know what? Like, based on, like, once again, based on the conversation, it seems like you just do it for yourself, right? Yeah. You're, you're able to provide for yourself and your family. Yeah. And you don't necessarily, it doesn't seem like you're, that's, that's not a desire. Not, maybe the desire is the wrong word, but that's not your priority. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it, maybe it should be, but it's also a function of time, mm-hmm. you know? There's only so many hours in the day. There's so yeah. There's only so many, and like you said, you're in a two-year website project. It's like it's it, a it lot. Was, it was and meant to, to be like six months or, <laughs> or three. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's and to do something custom, which ultimately, I would like to do something that's custom, and then you know create a store and and have something that you know would would be producing residual income. Can I ask um, you, is that kind of the block? Because like for me. If I want to do something, I want to do it really well, and I want to have it, like you said, custom. Mm-hmm. I could easily just go to a Squarespace or do something that's just super boilerplate, and it gets the job done. Yeah, but I don't like that. Me neither. Is, that's your. Is that kind of that's where you're? That's definitely the block for yeah. sure. And it's like, okay, how much time do I need to sink into that? You know. Right. But obviously, it's, it would come with the benefits mm-hmm. eventually. Right. Once you've set it up. Right. And I definitely should have a website. I'm not saying that I can I can get around without one. Right. Fine. Yeah. But I should definitely have one. People can contact you on, on Instagram and be like, hey, yeah. can can I get a print of this somehow? For sure. Yeah. And I, I mean, it does happen. And you call up uh, and you like, call up Blake and be yeah. like, hey, you got that printer <laughs> yeah, at your place? Blake or I call Rick, like, you know, like get, get some prints made. But it's that's also just like another... It's another job, basically. Yep. You know, to be managing uh, a store, print, print, sta- print sales, and yeah. you know, I think down the line, I well, for sure, I'll get a website going. Um, Maybe when the kid print. comes along, and you got to spend a little bit more time, a little in, bit more home time, home time, yeah, yeah, office time. Yeah, I've got a couple projects that are lined up for desk, desk. <laughs> of course, <TV>. you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll see. I mean, that that's definitely like on the list get a website but for the most part it's like everybody is just like falls on to social anyway so mm-hmm. in terms of like having a place for my current work to live it's just the easiest to post it onto instagram yeah yeah well, there's something said to be to have a nice big beautiful you know for sure and i love i love prints is your I house think. loaded with prints? Uh, and there's no no more space <laughs> <laughs> it's like i've done like you know galleries and things like that right and had my, my prints showcased in different places around town and, and like traveling exhibits and stuff like that. Um, so I do, I have like a surplus of prints and, and I don't care to sell them cause I actually like looking at them too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love you know, it. I mean, I have too many. So I like, I, Fair put, enough. I put some in my friend's places, their Airbnb. So when you go and visit, you're like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to come over for a beer yeah. later. I'm going to yeah, look at, look at no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> not necessarily that, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I really like that. And I think that, you know, down the line, I definitely want to focus on, on doing more fine art printing mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. But that comes also with, uh, having the right uh, space to, to be able to pull that off. Right circumstances well. and the time. Yeah, yeah, you know, like it'd be nice to eventually have like a shop that I could create frames in and yeah. and like build these, you know, more elaborate pieces of art and whether it's just photo prints or whatever else I I, I would like to, to build with my hands or, you know, hand shape something or cool. you know, create power surfs, whatever. Do you ever like, hang any photos in the teepee? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what we do in the TP sometimes is we we set up a projector. Oh, cool! Yeah, and you just project. So you can get those little want. ones that attach to your phone now, right? Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, it just like plugs into a lightning cable or whatever, and and uh, yeah, it shoots shoots the image on the side, and you can watch videos or look at photos or you know sometimes like we're just camping and and uh, yeah, we'll just do like a little. Little slideshow, living the we life. We just like man. reflect on on fun times and things that we've seen, and it's it's kind of a neat way to just share photos. Like 
like when you're just hanging out, you just pull up the tiny little projector. Yeah, so you can actually just crouching over a phone, but you can actually, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, sweet. exactly. That's really like, cool. You know, you throw it onto a wall or ceiling or whatever. It's like, it's a pretty nice little little gadget, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I dig yeah, it. Yeah, it's pretty fa- fancy. I, I, I dig it. Well, but, man, uh, that was, uh, thanks for coming. Like, we've already gone like an hour and 10 minutes. Oh, wow. It goes fast, eh? Oh, yeah, I know, I know. Could sit I here mean, for a while. You, once you get going, it's like... Right? I mean, especially when you're talking about stuff you like to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Where can people find... Well, since you don't have any prints or anything yet, you know, yet. I'm sure you'll let me know when that happens, but uh, yeah. where can people go find you now? Well, I mean, Instagram is probably the easiest way, mm-hmm. you know? It's What's easy. the handle? It's Mason underscore Mashon. Easy peasy. Yeah. Too simple. Yeah, it's my name. Awesome. And uh, I'm going to get you to send me some some photos that we'll, we'll post up. Yeah, of course. Uh, on the website and on the on the Instagram site as well, and yeah, go go check out his work because it's awesome. And I think a lot of uh, this conversation was good for me because I've always, at least like I said, we've crossed paths a handful of times, but I've never actually had a full conversation with you. And you do all of these really fascinating things that I always wanted to know, like how does that work within his life? And it seems like that's pretty much what you do. You just live to live, and then you make everything kind of fit in place. Yeah, that's that's the idea. I mean, like, we have one one shot at it you know and to make the most of it is really the name of the game well, there you go I don't think there's a better way to end it off cheers buddy thanks, thanks Mark thanks for coming by cheers you've been listening to the Low Pressure Podcast the podcast for skiers this has been a Redmark Media production 